Can you hear me if we left you? I saw you just arrived. Awesome. Okay, I think it's time to start. Welcome to the sixth lecture, and we are past the halfway point in terms of lectures, and well, we're just in the beginning of the course, but you have lots of time to do assignments and stuff, right? From what I've heard, actually, it's, it's kind of like a planned thing, because you have other courses that are really heavy, right? So if I do a lot of the material in the beginning of this course, and you get started on your assignment, at least I've given you the possibility to even out your work a little bit. But I know how it is as a student, you do everything last moment anyway. But at least I've, I've done my part, right? I've tried. Um, so that's why I try to do everything early, like lectures early in the beginning of the course. Partly. Okay. Um, today, we're talking about performance and security. And uh, I think we've covered these in part before. So... Um, We'll see how the discussions go. Some of them, some of the discussions might be, I don't know, repeated, depending on what you come up with. Um, yeah, so same layer, same setup as before. Uh, basically, performance. It's about time, about, uh, well, mostly about time, actually. Uh, completing something in time, um, offering a service in time, doing certain, certain things within a limited set of time or as quickly as possible, et cetera, et cetera. So meeting time requirements. Or even, um, in some sense, scalability is also, of course, a performance issue, like a performance part, like handling a number of connections, handling a, a set of, um, yeah, so there is a scalability metric as well, like a quality metric called scalability. So performance and scalability are kind of, you know, they're very similar in that sense. Um, and I, I think that, yeah, as I said in the first lecture of these quality attributes lectures, there is lots of debates on where something belongs and it doesn't really matter. Um, but at least performance, as I've I'm going to describe it mostly here, it's going to be about time requirements and stuff. So handling interrupts, handling messages, uh, requests from users and systems, and talk events, etc. So uh, we're going to start off with a short discussion as normal. And guess what? We're going to do Google Mail as uh, an example. It's a very handy uh, software. Most people know about it, and it covers like all sorts of quality attributes. So uh, two and two, or two, three and three, just briefly discuss uh, these questions. When is performance especially important? How do we measure performance? How do we control resource demands? And how do we manage resources for, for example, Google Mail? And pick one example or, or pick two and answer these questions for each of them. So you don't need to cover everything, but just you know, focus on one or two things. Okay, let's give you. Uh, Jeremy in, in Kolefta, you, you get to talk to yourself. <laughs> She's sick today.
So, can I give some suggestions? Anyone? One case with Google Mail where performance is especially important. User interaction, and what part of, of the user interaction is performance demanding? So browsing around web UI, so I guess responsiveness then, right? Okay, so you want, if you click something, you want it to happen right away. I can definitely sympathize with that or I can relate to that because I used to be, like when I started with computers and internet and stuff, that was a while ago. Some of you might not have been born, well, yeah, you should have been born. Uh, but anyways, it was a while ago. Um, then um, um, we could, I mean, Waiting uh, 10 seconds for something to load was okay. I mean, it was frustrating, but it was okay, right? I think these days, one second is too much. Like, if something doesn't respond in one second, I usually go back and check another page. Like, if I Google for something, like maybe one or oh, two seconds. So, like at least one second, I, I don't really have time to press the back button or press, like, uh, anyways. So, yes, absolutely. If something does not respond within like milliseconds, I will get annoyed. So, um, okay. And how do you, um, well, controlling resource amounts, I mean, the reason why you'd have a non-responsive web interface, for instance, would be too many people accessing the services once and, and too much bandwidth usage or latency in your ISP and whatever. So there might be network problems in, on your end, which Google really can't do much about, right? Uh, but when it comes to resources that Google are handling, so how can they manage these resources? Any suggestion? The UI resources in this case, well, so we're talking about bandwidth and database access mostly, right? So how do we manage those resources? Anyway, I mean, I don't need to look at you. I mean, every, anyone can answer this, right? I don't, I don't want to, like, I don't want this to become like, if I say something, I have to answer every single question. I, like, anyone can answer, right? Add more hardware. Add more hardware, certainly that is an option. Um, you could also um, degrade the performance for non-paying customers, or you can have like a quality of service kind of arrangement. I mean, I'm, I know that Google is not using that at the moment, but adding more resources, uh, prioritizing critical events. Um, I, I think we've covered these in like the availability quality attributes, right? Simplifying, yeah, reducing the graphical, like maybe if you are aware that your connection is pretty bad, right? You could probably pick a, a less comprehensive theme maybe. Because um, a lot of the performance issues, like you load huge pictures and stuff like that. So again, I, if I'm going to do an anecdote, when I started doing web pages, which was in '96, um, I developed everything to work with. Uh, I think it's called Lynx, which is a text-based web browser. So everything I had to, do, uh, everything I did, I, I did to make sure they were backwards compatible with text-based stuff. And I know this probably wasn't necessary. And I also developed for the resolution 800 by 600 because, well, that was kind of like a, what people, at least I could count on people having that. Um, anyways, uh, sidetracked. So um, yeah, pick something less demanding uh, in terms of visual interfaces and stuff. Certainly, so uh, that's a good example. Could we have one more example, anyone? Scalability of databases, certainly. Um, so I would, I would, if I add to Google Mail also like the Google Drive stuff, I would, I would basically they are merged in, the in terms of data storage, right? So Google, they offer um, backup and stuff, and backup is typically quite expensive. And 
So um, how do you measure the performance? Well, it's quite easy. You like how much water storage do I have left, I suppose. Um, but also uh, scalability of database is also about uh, peak hours. How many accesses, ac how, how much access, hmm. ac what's the plural of access? Ac accesses? Ac anyway, <laughs> how many people are trying to access your database per second or whatever, right? Which becomes then a, a, a bandwidth issue as well, or, or connection issue. Uh, even it could even become a disk issue because bandwidth is pretty good these days. So you have to scale like the storage devices where the database is stored um, to make sure that they can handle the, the number of lookups per second and stuff. Um, control resource demands. Well, one way that they are actually doing is that they're limiting the size of storage, right? I have 15 gigabytes. I don't know if that's typical, right? And I, I'm using 14 at the moment, I think. So they, for, for non-paying customers, they limit how much, how many mails you can store. That's uh, assuming that's stored in like some form of database, right? Uh, so that is a way of controlling resource demands. You don't have more storage in there. And now I'm just talking storage amounts. Um, but, um, and then you can pay for more storage if you want. And then if you pay, of course, they will let you have more storage because they, then at least you're paying for the service you're using, which would otherwise we'd pay by advertisements. Now, how do we manage resources? Well, it's kind of what I just said, managing by controlling uh, access and stuff. But we, we also go back and look at like peak hours. And uh, one way you can actually manage these resources is to make sure that uh, you distribute data centers to be closer to a certain region. Like if we were all using um, hosts in America, right? We would have extra latency and that'll go for, for uh, user interfaces as well. Like it would have to travel, the, the traffic would have to travel far for us to get it, right? So of course you're trying to distribute the data centers a little bit all over and, and that's why Facebook is like just here. Because we are, like, even though we're in the very far north, in terms of network, we're quite central Europe because we have very good connections throughout Sweden and, and different routes from here, right? Uh, just to serve people the data as quickly as possible. So, so co-locating co the consumer of the data and the provider of the data as much as possible will actually help control these demands as well. And of course, you'll have def several servers serving the same information at the same time, so you will distribute the load between these. Uh, so that is a way to handle that as well. Okay, I think we've got the picture here, right? So, uh, just going through these, um, the general scenario kind of thing, what the book suggests. So it might be an in internal or external system, some events, either periodic, sporadic, or st uh, Stochastic. Uh, number of different operational modes this can happen in. Well, normal emergency peak load, overload, and we already covered peak load kind of. Uh, and we have a number of events coming in. And, and uh, we also said something about changing the level of service. This could be a way to, to handle this uh, quality of service things or a prioritized customer or, or degraded service or simpler UI or whatever. And we can measure whether we provide good performance by looking at latency, uh, deadline in terms of like, can you actually deliver in time uh, the data throughput or bandwidth, uh, jitter in terms of like message ordering and stuff, uh, how many miss, misses or, or like um, if you're missing messages and stuff like that because of, of load. So these are just some examples. I think we covered some other things as well in the discussion. Basically, um, did you, uh, customer satisfaction, I would, if I, if I go like a little bit further here, because that's if, uh, ultimately, at least in terms of any softwares that users are gonna use, 
um, customer satisfaction is ultimately the end goal, right? We want to provide data with timely enough, in a, in a timely enough way, so the customer is happy. And now we become more critical in terms of that, like where 15, 20 years ago we were, yeah, 10 seconds is frustrating, but okay. And now it's like one second is too much. Okay. So the goals um, basically is to um, generate, uh, respond to any requests to data and stuff like that um, within a certain time or uh, limit the amount of time something is allowed to, to run on the system and stuff. So uh, let's have a, a short discussion on potential um, tactics as well. Like how, what we can actually do. We covered some of them already. So there are two different groups uh, suggested here. So control resource demand and manage the resources. So discuss shortly what you think can be done to do these two categories and we'll cover them later on. So, any uh, suggestions apart from the ones we already mentioned so far uh, on how we can control resource demand? Do I make it difficult now by saying apart from the ones we already discussed? Okay, some nods. Okay. <laughs> any suggestion? Absolutely. Uh, some queue system. Um, I think it's listed here as a way of managing resources, but absolutely it's correct. Uh, queue system like, uh, oh, we only handle so many requests per time and you have to wait your turn. You can even do, um, uh, well, we'll cover that in a moment. Anything else? So the input was, can we identify the bottlenecks and then maybe utilize other resources or, or distribute the, the need somehow on less used resources maybe? Uh, absolutely. Um, 
I don't think it's covered uh, in exactly what you're saying uh, here in the list, but I would definitely uh, say that it's a possibility. Um, I mean, in general, identifying the critical resources is essential in order to control the demand, right? Like how, how many resources do we have available? What's our bandwidth maximum and what's our storage maximum and how many con accesses, <laughs> how many people can access per second and stuff. Uh, and if you know that, if you know that at some point we're gonna um, need more, you could either rent space, rent time, execution time at Amazon, or maybe you can degrade some other services at that time to provide access to, at that, that point. As you were saying, you can distribute and you can reorganize your system to handle higher peak hours for a certain time. Um, okay, uh, other things, uh, managing sampling rates. So this is more like when it comes to hardware. So um, when I started doing uh, healthcare research, I kind of came in with the idea that higher sampling rate is better for every, to every sensor. Now, I do a lot of activity recognition. And so we, I, I use accelerometer data, you know, how, how my phone mo moves in order to detect running and, and walking and stuff like that. Now, I think it's been proven that, or at least you don't need much more than 12 hertz or something like that. It's like, and, and I thought like, yeah, 100 hertz, go for maximum, right? You get so many outliers and, and so much uh, noise in the data if you just sample a lot. And well, you don't really gain that much, right? And what you end up with is 10, 10 times the amount of data because suddenly you have 100 samples per second rather than 12 or 10 or 12, right? And so calculation time or processing time would increase significantly tenfold, right? Or something like that, if it's linear. Um, so by having less data or sample, if you reduce the sampling rate, if you don't need more, you have less data to process and then you can provide in responses quicker. Um, limited event response, it's kind of like what you were saying, uh, someone was saying about the queue. Um, I think it's repeated later on, but like these are the maximum amounts of event responses I can provide. Like wait your turn, kind of. Uh, I, I'll, I'll check my sheet sheet to make sure that I cover that as well properly. Uh, yeah, so you only process the number of events up to a certain maximum. Uh, thing is, if you if you um, communicate this beforehand. And even you can provide some feedback, like we have lots of requests at this moment. Please uh, be patient. You can actually uphold some of the customer satisfaction because at least they've been notified, right? They, they don't need to wonder what's going on. Uh, so that is an important response as well towards this. Um, and, and you can actually schedule and plan and stuff like that accordingly. Prioritize of eight, uh, events. Well, quality of service, you can prioritize certain more important events. Again, if you, you need to kind of understand what the critical uh, events are and critical resources. Reduce overhead is uh, quite an important one in terms of like bandwidth and stuff. So XML, for instance, have lots and lots and lots of overhead, typically, unless you do like a minify, min, minimized, where you don't reuse proper variables and stuff like that. You can shorten it quite a lot. I do believe JSON is shorter, at least in terms of readability, um, because rather than having end brackets containing the entire word of things, you have like just a bracket. Uh, so it's a lot less text to send. Like for one user, it doesn't really matter because text is no data, but if you, you know, multiply it by millions of requests per second, then it adds up, right? So even text adds up to being gigabytes fairly quickly if you have enough requests. And the same goes with like uh, uh, jar files or if you use uh, um, web packages for, for services that you use, you get this min version, right? Like uh, jQuery min JS like the, the minimized version, which has no spaces, no new line signs, 
the variables are all A, B, C, D, E, F, G, rather than properly named ones. And it's a lot uh, less data that you have to like download. So that's why you use these min versions. Unless you actually need to go in and check something in the source code of it. Um, bound execution time. I think the bound execution basically says you are only allowed to process this thing for X amount of seconds or milliseconds or whatever. Now, that wouldn't work properly if you need to actually get to the end of something to actually deliver an answer, right? But consider tasks that can be split into parts. Uh, I'm not that good at blockchains, but I imagine like blockchains and bitcoins and calculations and stuff like that, right? You, you distribute a task into small, you segment it into smaller parts. So you can actually say you're only allowed to use this much processing time and then whatever you have calculated by then, that's what you get. And other things where by, ha by adding computation time, you increase the accuracy of it maybe, but you only get this much, much time. So whatever accuracy you've gotten by then, that's what you get to handle, to manage these resources. Uh, increase resource efficiency. Well, of course, you can improve the algorithms and stuff like that to improve computational time and stuff. Uh, can we have one or two suggestions on how to manage the resources? We already have, like, add more resources. That's a basic one, right? Anything else? We already also have kind of the queue. I think that's covered here. Um, anything else? Different nodes, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so basically, concurrent or several different uh, sources or computations at once, concurrent co computations. I think that was partly, you know, before as well, like those cases kind of uh, go hand in hand. Okay. So, yeah, first one increased resources. In introduce concurrency. It's kind of, well, Concurrency in this case will have more threads computing something, but might multi maintain multiple copies of computations. That was kind of what you were saying. Uh, maintain multiple copies of data. Uh, yeah, data being stored in several places. Uh, bound queue cases, that was mentioned before. Um, like, um, you only allow so many people to wait in line or, or to service at once, and the rest can be waiting or, or even be, not, be denied. At the moment, um, I actually did. I, I un, uh, accidentally used this bound queue sizes for one of my very very early research projects. Um, so I did before you can track people's progress doing this cross country skiing. There was a lot of it. We put some sensors on professors from here, and they they ran this race right. So we could me measure heart rate and, uh, and GPS, well, positioning, right? And we tracked it live, and it was before Google Maps, so we didn't really have, like, we had a different map service, which was not as uh, scalable, I would say. So, uh, and it was a Java applet as well, so now you can see kind of where in time this was, it was quite a while ago. And during this event, I got a call from the system administrator here at the university, and they said, well, you know that test you're running at the moment? Well, I got a, a notification from, our, from, from the database service saying that you reached a maximum number of connections. So we had more than 1,200 users, and that was the limit they set to the database access. So yeah, that's a kind of like a, bound queue site, you only get, you only service 1200 people and then everyone else is rejected, kind of. Um, that system was pretty cool, but yeah, it was pretty slow when 1200 people were trying to get data because I was not a good programmer then, so that the whole caching of maps and stuff like that, I mean, everyone fetched their own map and 1200 requests for that poor map service was not. Okay, uh, schedule resources. Uh, so if you know that 
uh, at this time of day, I'm going to have more resources because there's not going to be less, as many requests. So anything else that, does, that is not time critical, that not, does not have to be done now, I can do later. So that is also kind of a way, as you were saying before, if you identify the critical resources, maybe you can map it onto other structures. Well, you can also map it to other different times in some cases, which is kind of related to what you were saying. Okay, any questions about this? Do they make sense? Good. Uh, then we skip some slides. It's always good to skip slides. Oh, I had a teacher when I started, when I went to university here, he would uh, come into lecture with these plastics and he would have 60 of them and like he would put all of them at the, the projector at once, uh, the overall projector. And he said, these are not important. And then he threw them away and, and, and the class was five minutes. It was not a good class, but anyways, I'm not doing that at least. Okay, um, so let's go through the checklist quickly. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of these already. So find out what the critical um, responsibilities are. Um, what are the requirements? What, what, what parts of the system may encounter heavy load or, or time critical? That, that might be time critical. And then you have to basically design your system around supporting those areas, right? So now we're talking about planning your software architecture design being aware of these things so if you need to at, at some point allocate uh, reallocate executions to a different time if you need to um, implement uh, some form of load balancing if you need to have multiple copies of data or execution threads and stuff like all those things that you need to do to support these tactics that we just went through Someone needs to implement them and some, somehow it needs to be designed into the architecture. Um, yeah, so you basically, you need to look at like the processing requirements, the share resources, uh, performance related artifacts and all those things that, that goes into this requirement of the quality attributes. I, I, this it was working well in the moment. So, okay, coordination model. Um, so all these messages, all these requests coming in, uh, basically you need to have a good support system, a good mechanism for handling it, in order to guarantee delivery at the right time, uh, right throughput, uh, with as little latency as possible. In the Google Mail case, it kind of makes uh, it's quite easy to understand. We already covered some of these cases, so I think that is fairly straightforward. Stop me if you don't agree, or if you have any comments with us whatsoever. Uh, data model, again, identify the critical um, data that needs to be accessed a lot at certain times, uh, that is time critical. So we could consider uh, having multiple, multiple sets of data so we can balance the access load. Uh, we could co-locate uh, data to be as close to the receiver as possible. Um, we could try to yeah, partition the data uh, to different hard drives or whatever to reduce the load on a single in unit. Uh, reducing processing requirements in terms of how to process the data and, and we talked about uh, lowering the sampling rate and all those things as well, making things more efficient. And of course adding more resources. Yeah, mapping, okay, here comes the co-locating of physical resources um, to improve efficiency and stuff like that. And of course, quite obviously, things that are that require heavy computation, put that on the best processor. This is, you know, simple, I suppose. And resource management, again, realize what's the most critical components. And somehow you need to you, know, you need to monitor and manage the quality of service, and that is I think it's easier said than done because you know yeah we need to monitor it, but how do you actually? Um, I mean you, yes you can uh, you can monitor the number of requests per second or, or you know what your maximum is right, but then how do you manage that? How what do you actually do? And that involves all these other tactics. 
So I, I would probably, like as a, if, if someone asked me to design a system and they said, oh, well, put a um, monitoring and management system in place. In, if I were the, the initial designer and I was making like a, a layered module diagram, it would be kind of like this security thing that just goes over everything. It would be, yeah, monitor and manage. It would be not helpful, right? So going into details and actually putting all these components in there, um, I think it requires some thought and, and um, to design it well, design it properly, so that you can actually um, make it somewhat flexible as well. Because if you're adding new units, new computational entities, or new data sources, etc., if you are adding scalability to it, how do you actually, you know, attach this monitoring and management module, and, and you know, does it work properly for new sources? And binding time, um, yeah, typically you often have a lot of extra overhead whenever you have like a, a late binding where you need to send data back and forth and you need to package the data somehow. So whenever, they, whenever you need to introduce like a communication standard because you have a third party made components, typically that adds overhead in my experience. Uh, because you need to make to make sure it makes sense, so people can actually who develop it can actually you know understand what's going on. So uh, you need to consider that whenever you have late binding, uh, do, do you still fulfill the requirement of of the performance quality attributes? And choice of technology, final one for for this checklist. How does your choice of technology affect performance? Well, you can consider like like hardware choices, do we actually meet the requirements, the performance requirements? Do we add extra overhead? Um, can you control the, the resource limitations, etc.? And it's very easy to pick a very competent framework for something because you know it does everything, right? But it also means that you get other components with it. So I. Um, we had a software where we, we refactor it and we started using the Zen framework, but that is quite a massive framework. So if, you, if you're not caring about, well, I think it's, there's so many people using it, so they probably cared a, a bit about uh, performance as well. But for very simple t tasks, it does not make sense because you have a lot of comp uh, communication overhead. You have a lot of um, different packages involved because it's supposed to be so flexible. So you need to like run a lot of different sub modules and et cetera, et cetera. So consider that as well. Like whenever you are adding frameworks or middleware or whatever, what, what consequence does that have on other aspects of your software as well? It's not just, you get a lot of the other things for free or it actually might hurt you as well. That said, Frameworks, hopefully, if you pick a good one, there's been lots and lots and lots of people who've been trying to optimize it. So yeah, I'm, I'm saying hopefully because that's not always the case. Okay, um, I think we'll have a five minute break and then we'll continue with security.
uh, Simon's going, if I may ask. Oh, good? Forward. Forward. Yeah. That's, that's a good direction. Um, I, I do have some input on the planning of the automated testing assignment. I realized that I put the deadline just like the lecture on automated testing is on Friday and the deadline is on Monday. <laughs> Makes no sense. I will move the deadline um, for that. I don't think it's, it, it should be okay, I think. Uh, the, the, test, the, the automated testing assignment itself takes a day, I would say, to do. So it's not that big. Like I, I did it from scratch without knowing anything um, about unit testing myself. I did that in a day. So I think you should be able to do a similar. Because I think we're at the, at the time I was doing this assignment, I think we're at the same level so, of, of understanding of this. Now, then I've read about it since then. But. OK, uh, let's continue with security. Yeah, well, I, I don't really need to explain what security is, right? We, we want to protect data or protect our systems. Uh, we want to have user access control to make sure that we don't have unauthorized users, etc. We want to prevent attacks, um, which is could be unauthorized access, uh, people wanting to harm the system and make sure we fail to complete our availability requirements. Uh, they want to manipulate data records, etc., etc. But there are uh, there are some approaches to this, and. Um, there are some characteristics as well, one called the CIA. I don't know if that's appropriate or, or um, just happen to be like that. So confidentiality, we need to see, uh, basically protect the system from unauthorized access. Integrity, um, make sure the system is not subject to unauthorized manipulation, so you can't go in and manipulate the data. And availability to make sure that you actually do provide the service to people who are eligible to get the data, that you can actually provide the, the access uh, appropriately. There are some, some sub-characteristics to this as well. Of course, you need authentication. Uh, there's something called non-repudiation. Uh, it was slightly so, smaller text than I expected. Okay, so non-repudiation means basically that you keep track of who's doing what, and the transactions are being logged. So neither user or owner of the data or whatever can refuse or re what's the word I'm looking for? Well, neither, neither of them can deny that an interaction happened. You can track who's doing what and where, and uh, you, can, you can link certain operations or certain like if there's a malicious user, you can make you can link that malicious use to a certain individual. Or if the bank fails to give you your money or whatever, you can track what's gone wrong, etc. They they cannot refuse that it happened. So you make you keep keep logs of everything. Um, so um, reading here guarantees that the sender of a message cannot uh, later deny having sent the message. And the recipient cannot deny having received the message. Uh, then, of course, authorization, and then um, you know being able to grant uh, user privileges to perform certain tasks. Again, uh, let's have a short discussion on guess what? Google Mail <laughs> for security. I pick like one case um, and consider for that case, like that security case. Uh, what can be done to monitor this security issue uh, and when an attack is uh, detected and how can we measure whether your software architecture design has actually addressed such a problem? Like what, what are the metrics? How do you measure where it's, where, whether it's secure or not? So let's have two minutes or so.
So I don't want to interrupt good discussions, but let's uh, continue. So can I uh, get a suggestion for uh, a security situation that might occur? Anyone? I, had, I heard good discussion, so I know that there are answers out there. Could hear them from over here. Yes. Absolutely. So uh, if we detect a number of different, uh, what was the way you, you phrased it, and uh, access or intrusions or. At intrusion attempts, okay. So if you can detect a number of different intrusion attempts from a single user or from a single IP or etc., you can block them. So uh, then we already have what can be done to monitor the security. Well, you could first, there are a number of different ways you can detect it. You could have the very simple approach to have a maximum number of attempts. Uh, but you could also track behavior um, there's a company called, there is a spin-off from our university called Behavior Sec. Uh, that is, that is um, they actually uh, does, they, they actually do things for most of the Swedish banks, I think, to detect the typical user operation. So if suddenly you are doing something out of the ordinary, they will actually notify, I think notify the bank and maybe notify the user about the transaction. For instance, I don't know if you've encountered this, but I have colleagues who've had, so basically they, they've been abroad and they, they charged their credit card, and which is fine, the bank doesn't complain about that. And then they go, went back to Sweden and did something on their credit card, which is still fine. But then afterwards, there was another uh, charge to their credit card in the, the first country or the adult, you know, abroad country. And the bank basically called my colleague in this case and said, we have suspicious activity here because you were abroad, then you came back, and suddenly, like a day after, you were abroad again. That makes no sense. Someone is probably using your credit card, which was the case. So they blocked the transaction based on behavioral uh, information, like the, knowing this is probably not, you know, th th this is out of the ordinary. This is abnormal behavior, right? You can do the same with denial of service attacks. You know what the typical load would be uh, at some point. Like, or denial of service, I, I think there are better ways to detect that. But okay, for, for other intrusions, other uh, attempts or other t uh, attempts to get into something, you can detect what's normal behavior and what's abnormal behavior. And you can learn over time as well. So like this is unexpected behavior. Let's either block the user or uh, put the user in a subsystem where they don't have like, access to sensitive information, move the access control, or, or even like we are suspecting, you know, get an email to verify, and, and Google sends emails, like we uh, detect the login from a new computer, is this really you, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a number of different safeguards based on wanting to um, keep your security based on your current behavior or your typical behavior, because we are ha people of habit, right? Most of us. And every now and then we do something that is breaking the typical habit, like logging in on a different computer and, and we might get an email, etc. I mean, it's not too much work, right? At least just to notify people that we have seen something out of the ordinary 
you can ignore this email. Um, but if you think, if you suspect someone else is using your account, at least take action then. Uh, so there are lots of, of, of ways to handle this. Um, uh, how do we measure whether, whether the system is secure? Well, in this particular case, if you block them, the system is still secure and you can, you can actually keep track of what kind of information they accessed, right? And uh, if they modified any uh, data, you can, um, if, you, if you store logs of what the previous value was, etc. You can go back to previous version if it was sensitive data, etc. If you detected that it was actually malicious use. Can we have one more suggestion? Okay, let's continue. We're going to have tactics as well, so uh, we're going to cover a few of these. This is a long one. I, I apologize for this, so we'll, we'll cover it. Um, like I'll point to where I'm, I'm looking. So the source, basically, the source is typically another user or another system, a man in the middle attack or whatever. So some form of human attack or from an outside organization. Stimulus, uh, so unauthorized attempts to display data or change data or delete data, modify data. Uh, we even try to. Um, disrupt a service, etc. Environment, well, online or offline systems, uh, connected to or disconnected from a network, etc., etc. So fully operational, partial operational, not operational. So those are basically different operational states. Uh, transactions, so um, either we are protected or we are, uh, the services are not being manipulated without authorization. Um, we were able to identify who's using the information correctly. Uh, we can, basically, they cannot claim not having sent something or not having received something. Uh, so those are responses we would like to achieve, right? Um, and we make sure that the data is being used for legitimate, legitimate, eh, legitimate that's still the wrong pronunciation, right? Leg, legitimate, le, legitimate. Okay, anyway, it's my English. Um, leg legitimate use. Uh, and things you can do, you basically track these activities. You access, you track the modifications being done, um, access to data and services. And if you suspect something, you notify the appropriate persons or entities or banks or whatever, right? A number of responses you can do. Um, you try to find out if the system was compromised, how much of the system was compromised, what part, what were they looking for? Because you want to detect trends, right? If people are looking for certain types of data, then maybe you need to, to secure that or, or fix some breach. And you need to find out how, how did they get in? What were they looking for? What kind of person was this? You need to kind of like make a profile of the, the attack. Um, and uh, you can, you can uh, as a response measure or metrics, uh, you can you know, find out how much time passed before an attack was detected. You, of course, want to detect as soon as possible. How many attacks were resisted? Um, how quickly you can recover from an attack, like to restore the system to functional operation? And how much data uh, is vulnerable to a particular attack? So if you created a profile on um, like this is sensitive information, but we have to make it online. Well, can we at least protect other kind of information? Can we separate uh, common information from sensitive information? Can, if, if, for instance, you have to deliver information about uh, people's usage history of something, can you at least keep the username anonymous or something like that? Can you keep the, the information that can link some information to some other person anonymous? Can you keep the password from the username? I mean, all those things, right? To keep the data secure. Uh, some, uh, some scenarios. Um, actually, when I, when I started the secondary high school uh, in Osset, I had a um, computer teacher who, um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna ignore this example for now, oops, so, sorry. He, um, I think he was fired from his company or he left, I think he was fired from his company. 
And before he left, he made all the computers in his company play the Swedish national anthem at, at noon, which is kind of malicious. But and we also had a teacher here who was fired who uh, took down all the web pages that he was ever involved, like all, for all the courses he was ever involved in, and replaced them with these are the courses this uh, this university can never give again because everyone sucks, basically. So yeah, trying to. That, that's why you have these in movies where if you fire in someone, you escort them out of the building and stuff like that. Well, it's just to make sure that they don't destroy things on the way out, right? Uh, if you have an IT administrator, you need to like, if you, if you suspect there might be malicious uh, administrators, um, then make sure that their access to data is revoked before they might get disgruntled. Anyway, so this is kind of worst case scenario. So another scenario, um, so a disgruntled employee from a remote location attempts to modify pay rates uh, table during normal operations, the system maintains an audit trail, and the correct data is restored within a day, etc. So that might be a way to handle things. I have some other examples later on, but we'll cover those when we get to the tactics part. Funny things. Okay, let's uh, have a, a small discussion as well on, on these four categories for things you can actually do. So to detect attacks, we already covered some of those. Um, to resist attacks, like what can you do to, to prevent them from happening? How to react to certain attacks and how to recover from the attacks? So like two, three minutes. So any suggestions on detecting attacks? Can I get one? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, you can check valid operations, you can check checksums check and hash tables, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Like, has the message been tampered with? All those things. Absolutely. I think that is uh, very verified message integrity is covered slightly by that. Uh, so basically, you detect you can, to detect you can detect intrusion. You've already got that as an example. Like people trying to, to 
intrude on the system. Um, detect service denial attacks by looking at typical behavior, a typical, typical load. Um, there are certain markers when it comes to denial of service attacks uh, that can be identified as abnormal behavior. Verify message integrity with, you know, uh, checksums, etc. cetera. Uh, even detect message delays. So if you have abnormal delays, it could be either um, like bad network connections or man in the middle attacks, et cetera. Spoofing maybe, things like that. Uh, any suggestion on how to resist such attacks? Yes. Move sensitive calculations from the client to service. Uh, server, absolutely. Uh, I think that is even covered here. So, uh, anything else? Control all the inputs to the application. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Right, right. Um, okay, control all the inputs, make sure that they are what they're supposed to be. Kind of like verifying message integrity, kind of, yeah. But yeah, I've definitely seen that with PHP code, where you can do, after the question mark, you can, like, spoof your stuff. And I've seen academic people who are experienced in, experienced in development, who claimed, well, we secured it because we have like all the PHP stuff is in the server side. So of course it's secure. I mean, they can't access it. Well, you know this whole post and get stuff, right? Well, you, you know, you can like spoof that. So we showed it by basically saying, well, at the moment I'm not logged in because you only set the session ID during log, log in and you never like verify that the session ID is still valid when you do all these other transactions. I've seen that happen. And then people, then I just show them, well, if you just put this bar here, then I can, without logging in, I can get everyone's user information as if I was an administrator. And yeah, after that, I suggested, well, let's just do a proper framework because there are things handling these things and stop doing afterthoughts for security stuff. Okay. Uh, just to go through them very quickly, uh, these, some of these are very basic. So identify which people are actually allowed to have access to certain things and make sure that nobody else is going to get access. Uh, make sure that those can be authenticated properly and that they stay authenticated using, you know, the appropriate technology that they can be authorized. Uh, limit access. Um, so make sure that people are not supposed to have access to certain information, do not have that. It's very easy to forget that, or very easy. I've seen it happen. People forget, uh, like, even the client, or e even, like, a customer have, could have access to uh, user uh, authentication data and stuff like that because they forgot to separate between administrator and, and client and stuff. I've seen it happen. Um, so make sure that you only have access to what you're supposed to have access to, rather than having like a, you get access to everything as long as you're a user of the system. Um, limit exposure, um, basically sensitive parts, you can put them in like, this computer has no internet access, access or it can only be accessed from this uh, particular computer with this particular MAC address and ID. I, I personally don't know how, how easy it is to spoof, uh, MAC address and uh, it's I'm sure it's probably possible um, so I'm not a security expert I that's just <laughs> um, I, I know that I need to look out look out for these kind of things and even encryption is like most encryption techniques are cracked by now like so um, um, there are at least ways you can make sure that one computer only communicates with another computer by yanking the public network connection from that computer and make sure at least those only. And then, of course, this computer needs to be secured somehow as well, right? 
not having a network, not having a network cable or Wi-Fi capability is a very way, good way of securing a system uh, from from online access. Pardon? Powering off the system is a very good way of securing a system. Absolutely, totally agree. Um, pen and paper locked into a bank vault is also a very uh, secure way. Uh, okay, encryption. Um, I mean, a lot of the times uh, we just want to help the, the honest people not to get tempted, right? So sometimes HTTPS and encryption is sufficient for non-sensitive uh, information. For other types, then we need to do more in detailed um, solutions for, for securing information. But regardless, encryption, I think there are encryptions that are way more difficult than others. I take way more effort to uh, crack than others. And if we're talking about time here, like if I can delay uh, a, a malicious user from cracking sensitive information for two days, and certainly there are, there are encryptions that could like slow them down enough, right? I think. Uh, and, and if I can be able to, if I can detect the information before, at least then I can do something about it. Like I, I can detect that they stole lots of information. It's encrypted. I have two days to, to like, everyone change their password now, basically, you know, things like that. So at least there's some way to, to, to fix things. Or maybe I could, uh, depending on what type of information it is, of course. Um, separate entities, it's kind of, Lim is access, it's similar to limiting uh, to limiting exposure um, to separate them between different entities. Changing default settings is also a very good thing. You know that you could probably um, steal uh, most of Holly Davidson motorcycles fairly easily because before they have. Uh, so, so I have a Holly Davidson motorcycle, right? And I have like a, I have a motion detection alarm. So if you sit on it, the alarm goes off and it prevents you from starting and everything like that, right? Which means that for short things that I need to do downtown, I don't really lock my bike. I have this really nice, uh, you know, radio control alarm system. So I don't, I'm not afraid of people stealing it for short things. I have changed my default code, but the default code for unlocking most holidays on bikes is zero, 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 right? And you use the blinkers to do this. And a lot of people are like me who don't lock their motorcycles when they go do simple things. You could just go zero, 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 and most of them you could drive away because not all holidays and riders are computer savvy to change their password, right? I'm, I'm just saying. Um, uh, and it's actually not. Like you need to find the way, the place in your manual and actually do it. Like it's not super simple to change either. So a lot of the bikes would have zero, 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 zero. So, but don't go steal any motorcycles. I'm just, <laughs> uh, okay. So change your default settings. And I, I think for like Apache servers and stuff, if you don't change your default settings uh, for certain things uh, or databases even, I think there are ways you could get into things fairly easily by just knowing what the system is in the default state. Okay, to react, uh, I'm just going to cover these because it's fairly easy. Uh, kick them out, revoke access, we cover that one. Lock the computer, turn it off, you know. <laughs> uh, inform people that a uh, security breach has happened, make sure that they can take the necessary steps. Let's do the last ones as well. Uh, to recover, if you maintain an audit trail, like what happened, what transactions were being made, maybe you can undo certain operations, you can restore the information to a default state if they were mo modifying it. So that is also restoring things. And then, of course, you have all the availability tactics that we already went through. Okay. And I'm sure there are lots and lots of other ways to secure a system that is not covered here. Okay, let's skip some slides. Checklist. I think this is fairly fairly straightforward as well, so I'm, I'm going to go through them, and then we can end a little bit early. So, 
who has access to what do they have access, make sure that you can like limit the access to certain things if they're not supposed to have. So you need to be able to authenticate, you need to grant and deny access, etc. Keep logs and records, um, features to do undo, to do undo, to undo uh, certain operations, to restore information, encrypt, like all these things, you, someone needs to implement somewhere, encryptions, notifications to people to notify that some breach has happened. Um, uh, you know, rec how to recover, you need to have some recovery mechanism, et cetera, as well in your code, um, validation. So these are basically all the tactics, things that we do, talked about, things you need to cons consider when you uh, implement things in your code. Coordination, so anything that we, we communicate, communications, et cetera, make sure that you secure the connections, transmissions are encryption, encrypted, et cetera, and that's not, like it, it, that's, does, that alone does not provide perfect security, but at least it's one out, out of many steps, right? Um, recognize abnormal behavior, uh, high network demands, et cetera. Limit, restrict, re and, and deny connections, et cetera. Data model, consider how sensitive your data is. The problem is that if you don't make a proper separation between sensitive and non-sensitive data, then as I've seen many cases in academic softwares, uh, well, this is not so important. It doesn't matter if people don't, if, if people happen to find out. I myself am guilty to having set uh, passwords in a, a cookie, encrypted password still, but uh, I, yes, stop looking like that, me like that. Uh, it, it was, uh, it, it, the computer itself did not have outside the internet connection, so, so it's kind of fine. It was an in-home uh, Wi-Fi system, so I, but it was designed to be public, but it never went public. So I don't feel super guilty, but, but at least that could have, like, I'm aware that it's a bad way to do it, but it was a very convenient way to do it, to have the password set in the cookie to help the people with dementia not having to log in all the time. Um, but yeah, uh, where did I want to go with this? Uh, yeah, sensitive information. So basically when they had access to this, now, I, I didn't expect any of the persons with dementia in this particular case to go in and check the user database and stuff. So I didn't really bother securing that part since it was not connected from the outside either. But yes, they did have access to that as well. Uh, so it, potentially, if we had a very computer savvy person with dementia, they could have accessed the information from other people. Um, so yeah, separating sensitive with non-sensitive information is useful. Um, differences in access rights, um, checking if, if access is being logged, encrypted, can data be restored? So that's about data. Um, mapping with architectural elements. Um, well, again, thing is, if you detect an intrusion, you can start moving people to a less uh, sensitive system maybe, or, or um, system where someone is monitoring, perhaps, or, or something like that. So you can check the access rights. You can, uh, you know, check what, I mean, the system might reorganize itself if it's under attack or if you suspect certain behavior, etc. But of course, if you are a developer, you need to consider those things. Like, uh, someone needs to plan for it because otherwise everyone is going to do their own kind of security solution. It's good to have a guidance that goes throughout the project, right? rather than just having this lay, multi-layered um, module diagram where security is on like, oh, add security. That's not gonna get the system secure. It's just gonna get people that, yeah, I did, my, I did my part, I did my secure thing here, but if you don't have a solution for the entire project that someone actually thought through, it's probably not gonna be secure. Like, there's gonna be potential breaches uh, in between things, et cetera spoofing possibilities, et cetera, and stuff like that. Like, for instance, yeah, but we had a security and we set the session ID in the beginning and nobody ever checked it because the other people weren't aware, you know? Okay. And even session ID could be spoofed, I think. Um, as I said, I'm not an expert, but I suspect it can be spoofed. Okay. Um, yeah, safeguard sensitive information, check the read and write, the modify operations and stuff. And for resource management, what are the critical resources? Again, this is a very common question, but 
if you know that like the monetary system in in like blizzard's monetary system of course all the login and, and passwords are very very important and so are all the credit card information um transactions like they they could host games they could let people log in and uh, play but they would refuse people to do any um purchases i've seen that happen a few times like the purchase the store is down because we cannot uh ensure authentication and you're not allowed to modify or check your details etc but we can host games for you because that is less insensitive like yes you can be troll for a while but on someone else's account so i, I think i've seen that happen a few times um so basically uh, i'm checking the critical resources what, what what can people have access to in a kind of a degraded operation right uh, so how do we safeguard them uh, how do we limit access if attacked um, how do we provide continuous service so that is kind of related maybe you can provide some of the service even if it's, the system is under attack while other things are not available Oh, by the way, I think this whole authentic, the, the whole purchase thing might also have been an availability part, like where they had too many access, well, too much access. I, I will never get wise on that word. Anyways, uh, too many attempts to, to purchase things at once might cause problems as well. Late binding. Um, so whenever you have the possibility to, to bind something at a late time, like add new resources or new technologies, whatever, you introduce kind of a security risk, right? Because suddenly there's a very trivial way or a very natural way to introduce spoofing or, or man in the middle attacks, et cetera. So all, is this resource trusted? And how do you ensure that it is trusted? How can you ensure that things are authenticated properly, et cetera? Uh, so something to consider. And choice technology, make sure that the technology itself is, supports those tactics that you decide to use. Any questions on security? Any questions on this lecture in general? On my lecturing style? My <laughs> Send me emails in that case, if you don't want to have a long discussion now, I don't know. Okay, thank you for today, and see you Friday. Oh, I just saw your messages, yeah, Jeremy. Let's, let me read them. I actually didn't see the Adobe password scandal, but uh, I, I can call you, I think, so we can talk privately. <laughs>